Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by supervising sound editor, sound designer, and re-recording mixer, Wayne Pashley, whose work includes Mad Max Fury Road, Wolf Like Me, and more recently, Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. Welcome to the show, Wayne. Uh, thank you so much, Gordon. It's lovely to be here. I, I want to know, <laughs> what is it like working with Baz? Because he has such unique <laughs> vision for working on projects. Like everything he touches has a unique twist or feel to it. So how do you get on the same page with someone like that? Wow. Well, look, honestly, Baz uh, is seriously uh, a great joy to, <laughs> to work with. It's tough. It's long hours. Uh, the demands are great. But the the passion that he brings and basically infuses into the entire crew is is unmatched in my experience you know i've known baz now for 30 years because i started <laughs> him on strictly ballroom that was oh, wow. first, yeah when i first met him um uh it, you know it was uh, i was nervous because the guy the guy was a force of nature immediately you know, mm -hmm. and um, when I saw Strictly Ballroom at the time, it was on a VHS. Yeah, it was on VHS tapes, mm -hmm. five of them actually. And before I saw Baz, I was watching the the edit, the first edit that um, Jill Billcock had done, and it, I was blown away. You know, I'd never even heard of Baz before. You know, this was his first film, and of course, Baz comes from you know the world of opera. Mm -hmm. So, in, in a way, you know. Yes, he has his critics, but he also has his fans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, in, a, in a way, I think that Baz's filmmaking is is its own genre. You know, I don't honestly believe he makes films. He makes he makes opera. He makes theater. Mm -hmm. And and I think that with Baz comes, you know, all the, the great leadership and the, the, the he's a master storyteller, really. He's a visionary. He. Mm -hmm. comes in with uh you know uh, all the risks the risk taking really because the the subject matters that he tackles are always full of risk whether it be elvis or whether it be mm -hmm. um, f scott fitzgerald with the great gatsby you know honestly you, you there's not many people that will tackle those projects yeah you know? and knowing that there's you know there's going to be controversy in some way around his mm -hmm. film so um, yeah, to to work with Baz is 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 one of uh, a total immersion. You uh, you are taken on this extraordinary magical journey. You know the research is paramount. You have to the, the research that you've got to do is got to be deep. And um, you know at the end of the day, though, it's it's a complete joy. And as a artisan of sound he loves sound he loves music and he loves visuals mm -hmm. he's a maximalist and he yeah. pours it in there and and you know you, you you go you go along for the ride and you know buckle up it's 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 magical really this is the best word i can come up with <laughs> i think so with strictly ballroom when i first met my wife there was two movies she made me watch to make sure we were on the same page. And one of them was Strictly Ballroom and the other was Dirty Dancing. Oh, so, my, goodness. <laughs> she, oh my goodness. She wanted to make sure, like, does he like Strictly Ballroom? If not, he's not the right person. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, that's right. Well, actually, I remember a, a, I remember a, an episode of Ally McBeal many years ago. And it was so funny because they used that same sort of idea in an episode. <laughs> where Ali uh, was a lover of Moulin Rouge and, oh, really? um, and everyone else didn't. <laughs> yeah, and it's like that, that, that sort of like you know, gave her, her her compass to whether she was going to like someone. It was so funny. But now, um, yeah. with, with something like Elvis, what, was, what, were you, what were you researching for something like Elvis? Well, well when, when ba I knew that Baz was very interested in making the film uh, at the tail end of The Great Gatsby. Mm -hmm. And and Elvis, you know, was 
someone that I grew up with, I loved his films. I loved his music, you know, and, and in fact, you know, I, uh, my um, partner and in the, not only sound, but uh, in life, uh, Libby Villa, she and I both loved um, Can't Help Falling In Love, the song. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have it inscribed, um, take my hand, take my whole life too, on our wedding rings. Oh, wow. So it's kind of like this incredible full circle. So when when Baz said he wanted to do Elvis, uh, well, I was completely blown away. And, and of course, five years later, you know, I thought, is it ever going to happen? And then he rang, he came here to the studio and... Um, started to, I hadn't read the script at this point and uh, started to go through the, uh, the, the, the pitch basically. And I think as he was sort of talking about the film, um, you know, I was kind of getting a little bit sort of like, you know, I wanted to ask all these so many questions about what part of Elvis's life are we tackling mm -hmm. you know, in the narrative? And um, he said the, his entire life. <laughs> And, you know, you kind of go, well, hang on a minute, how, how's that going to happen in two and a half hours? So, you know, but I could tell when Baz was talking about the film and what his dreams were for it and his vision for the movie, um, I could see as he was talking to me, all of a sudden he was thinking sonically. And he started to, from the fact that he wrote the script and all, all, all and everything else that he had going through his head from the music catalogues and all the, or the business side of it and all that stuff, I could see him, he, he was talking to a sound guy and imparting his kind of almost like his first thoughts. Mm. And, and I was just catching them, catching them as, as they were coming. My head was reeling, you know, I was like, what is Elvis sonically? It was, you know, it's clearly it's the music. It's the, it's all, it's the cars, it's the authenticity, it's the, uh, of, of the times, you know, the, mm -hmm. the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the tragedy, you know, the sort of Shakespearean sort of like narrative. I was like, you know, kind of reeling with all that stuff. And, uh, and then, of course, it was the crowds. And so the crowds were fundamental um, from my point of view in, in order to make them authentic and, um, and also have the crowds be be emotional and interactive and immersive for, for an audience. So that was mm -hmm. a big, that was a big deal, but particularly during a pandemic, yeah, you, know, you couldn't get like big numbers together. Um, so so they were they were the they were the sort of like the 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 that was the first meeting about Elvis and, and how how we were going to tackle it. And basically, at the end of that meeting, his he had a couple of things to say which were takeaways which was, um, he said, Wayne, we're, we are about to embark on the great American operatic tragedy, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, he said, I want this soundtrack to be an audio visual wonder, and I want it to be triumphant, gorgeous, uh, awesome, and emotional. And then the last thing as he left the door, he said, protect Elvis Presley. And the door closed. <laughs> <laughs> And we were on. Yeah. And yeah. that was it. Yeah. And so there was a lot to take on. So the research side of things, I started reading everything I could, you know, Peter, Gul Peter Gulnick's books, uh, the, the, um, the life of, uh, um, and all the commentary on Colonel Tom Parker. Because mm -hmm. I knew nothing about Colonel Tom, really. I knew of him, you know, but I didn't know the background. Yeah. And so there was a lot of research to do. Uh, with with uh, the story itself, and then um, and then of course there was the technical side of things. You know, starting to dig around for the you know what were the, what were his favorite guitars, what were his microphones that he used in the various periods of his life. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, and that's kind of where we started with the microphones because we had an incredible musical props department who um, collected all the amplifiers, the guitars, the right mic stands, the, you know, the Shaw 55s, the RE15 mics they used in Vegas, you know, yeah. and the LTEX and all that stuff. So what they did was they got a hold of those um, authentic uh, vintage microphones and mm -hmm. restored them all. 
And they had them all restored and all working and they were going to be used, you know, uh, in order to uh, have a seamless, you know, filmmaking process where when Austin was speaking on stage or um, filling in the gaps of where the original Elvis material was not sonically good enough from the original masters, you know, um, so we could use all that sort of technology and um, and rebuild from you know, from an authentic point of view, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that was there was a whole that whole technical thing. What are we doing? Are we you know we're doing playback? Is that what's going to happen? And uh, and and Austin will have an in ear piece and mime. You know, is that the deal? But we can get more into that. But that was that was a testing process that we went through, and then when we realised that that in fact Austin is now actually our secret weapon here mm -hmm. because he is Elvis Presley and he's his boys you know absolutely channeled Elvis and not only had all the he had the movement coaches and the dialogue the dialogue down completely you know and of course he could sing so and and he could sing like Elvis Presley and I would defy many people you know whether they could pick between Elvis and Austin Mm -hmm. Who, who's what and it within the movie oh yeah. so you guys actually like mixed in some elvis when you were we did that? a lot of that well basically um what happened was in the 50s um it was it's all austin completely so right. austin sang everything um and um live uh, you know as well so during the shoot which was again monumental challenge with uh with recording and you know, the number of microphones out there and all that um, so, yeah, uh, what, 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 I got just going back, we mm -hmm. did a, we did a test in 2019 in December, where I met Austin for the first time, and we had a very sort of basic set, and, um, and uh, a lighting rig, and, um, and Mandy Walker was there with the camera, and we had the music department, and our sound recordist, um, David Lee, all set up. And so we were there really fundamentally to check sync between, yeah. between playback and camera. So we started the day with playback and, uh, and Austin miming. So that was great, all tested great. So then we went for round two, which was having playback, but Austin singing with the Shaw 55. And so he was still in ear pieces, but basically singing as well. We mm -hmm. did that and we thought, my God, this is incredible. It's like he, he's right on the money. And that was great. Uh, around lunchtime, Baz walked in, asked how the tests were going. We said, yeah, fabulous, blah, blah, blah. And he, of course, as Baz does, he threw out the challenge and said, okay, well, now after lunch, you're going completely live. So bring in a double bass, drums, guitarist, bring them mm -hmm. in. And we're going to shoot live. I want everything mic'd up. We're going to do it. And um, so we did. Austin performed, uh, not only singing, but also a movement as well with his wonderful coach, Polly, um, and with the guitar and swinging the guitar. And I, by the end of that day, I, I was so blown away that I felt like I witnessed Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. Like I, I just saw him. It was extraordinary. So that changed everything. Because from there, Baz said, this has proved now that in a sh in, 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 with the shooting process, we are going to do more live than not. And so, okay. So cut to the movie as it is now and as it stands, Austin is all the 50s. Uh, in the 60s with the 68 uh, special, um, we had the original Elvis Masters from NBC. Wow. Sonically, it was not fantastic because it was, um, you know, like I think it was, it was stereo for it. And we kind of thought, oh, geez, you know, how are we going to do a Dolby Atmos, you know, immersive mix? Mm -hmm. it, it was so shaky and thin and all that stuff. But with, uh, with the technology, we sort of boosted it up. We also did overlays of musical instruments just to some of the instrumentation to give it a bit of, um, a bit of grunt. Yeah. And then, of course, Austin sang along with it and so he filled in all the gaps where elvis originally went off mic oh interesting and of course then every performance attribute in terms of uh breathing uh dialogue to the audience all that stuff 
is all Austin. So that was a weave. We took the weave uh, idea through into the 70s in Vegas and all the Vegas stuff was uh, from original masters from RCA. So with those, we had what they call stems. So you had <laughs> the master multi-track recordings. And so you had Elvis separated from the, the drums or from the sweet inspirations or um, the Imperials or the guitars, et cetera. Uh, it was great to have that. But again, you know, um, it had to be somewhat restored and somewhat bazified at times <laughs> where, where you had a bit of overlay of the drums because you had one mic on the drums. You didn't have the kick and the snare and everything separate. So, you know, that was all mic'd up for those performances. And then, of course, Austin, uh, uh, again, sang along with it, with all the breathing and all the dialogue and all the, um, the fill-ins. So again, a big weave, but 70s was primarily Elvis. Interesting. You know? well, yeah. Now, I talked to a friend who's in sound and when I told him I was talking to you, he said, can you ask him about the Scream Queens and Keening? <laughs> I, what is that? What can you tell me about that? Okay, well, the, the Scream Queens were uh, a team of young women who were uh, first picked out of the Hayride sequence uh, in the 50s shoot. And as I say, this was, don't forget, this was shot during the pandemic. So kudos to the production team that managed to pull this off because they had 500 extras in there. And out of those came these uh, women who uh, were able to scream with, with, with that lust, you know, and that hunger, you know. And so um, all of those women went, went to a screaming class called the Scream Queens. Okay. <laughs> and they went through a, an intensive round of how to maintain their voice like, like Olympiads so they didn't blow <laughs> out, you know, their, um, their vocal cords. But uh, those, the Scream Queens were just magnificent. So, of course, we recorded them in post as well. Mm -hmm. And so they were fundamental in the in the build of the narrative, of course, and the you know the sort of I suppose the the changing American cultural landscape of that time, you know, where the, where where you know it's sex and sort of inhibitions were starting to come out. Mm -hmm. You're seeing this guy who kind of looks androgynous in many ways with makeup and wearing pink suits and things, you know, and 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 wiggling. <laughs> That, um, that 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 was that was fundamental in, in 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 sort of like showing how this guy changed the world mm -hmm. you know, and the thinking changed you know out of the conservative years post-war so um the screen queens were uh fundamental in the big start of the crowds it was so strange because when i started thinking about that beetle mania that mm -hmm. that uh, elvis mania you go, okay, so we, you know, in our libraries, our sound effects libraries and stuff like that, you know, that we've collated over 30 odd years that you go, we really don't have anything like that yeah. within our libraries. And any female screams that we tend to have in our library from past films, they're a horror, you know, yeah. they're, they're, <laughs> and, and they're, they're, it's, it sounds very different. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a female horror scream versus a sexual lust or whatever. Yeah, you know, and um, and so yeah, so that was that was that. Um, we had David Lee, our um, production sound mixer, on set, uh, also record uh, with um, these ambisonic microphones, which uh, which are which are uh, full surround microphones. Mm -hmm. Uh, we used the Sennheiser and that was fantastic because of course, when you have 500 extras, you know, in the room, you want to get what you can. You can. Uh, then on top of that, we did eight um, full day sessions with our wonderful um, post-production casting agent, Barbara Harris, mm -hmm. who put together um, an incredible team of not, a, not only more screaming, but uh, also the, the men and everyone else. And, yeah, with authentic, you know, um, black, white, yeah, southern, you know, uh, all the voices. Yeah, we recorded in um, New Orleans to get all the authentic, you know, um, 
voice and and the um, specific language of the time as well. Mm. But the crowd sessions are throughout. You know, yeah, and was huge. Yeah, big, big challenge. So when you got uh, when you get the script for something like Elvis, like what? Um, how do you go about? You know, making notes in the script, but thinking about the story for the sound. Like, how do you? I you know, I'm not phrasing that way, but I guess like, how do you take that story and make a story out of sound? Like, what are your some of your ideas that you make notes of in the yeah. script? Well, what I what I tend to do, it's a lot of uh, a lot of paperwork first. So, mm-hmm. so um, the the script itself, when it came uh, uh, in uh, 2019. I had the first script and then the, then when the pandemic hit and Tom Hanks got sick uh, that was five month gap we, uh, we thought the film was going to get buried by that yeah that, when that all happened but anyway um uh during that five month downtime uh Baz also took that opportunity to do a lot of rewriting so it was a sort of evolving but fundamentally what I do is I, I, I take the script and start breaking it down my first thing I do is look for character Hmm. So look for point of view. So how's the point of view um, as I'm reading it working? Is it is it from Colonel Tom's point of view? Is it Elvis or Priscilla's point of view? So I start looking for for character. Uh, um, what 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 does it mean? Is so Colonel Tom is a heavy man. He has a cane. All those sort of like basic attributes. Mm-hmm. Does he have a little bit of a limp because of his age? Uh, and of course, Colonel Tom. Um, you know, we had all that, you know, however you want to perceive it, but the fact that he was an illegal immigrant, you know, he's from Holland, you know, his background is dubious. We don't, we know, there's a, mm-hmm. there is a story about, you know, um, why he left Holland. I won't go into now. And, and the fact that he went underground and went into the carnival. So you kind of go, okay, so carnival, we're talking, his favorite film was um, Nightmare Alley. You know, uh, there's the whole geek aspect um, where he Mm -hmm. promotional sort of situation. So you had, and he's also um, the the colonel. Yeah, so it's all that character stuff. The colonel, you know, was regarded also as a bit of a mentalist. Like Mm -hmm. some people believe that he could, you know, you know, make you do what he wanted to do. So he was an exceptional person, really. And um, however you want to look at the colonel, but he was a genius in his own right in terms of marketing and and selling product, you know. Yeah. And so there's that, there's the Elvis side of things. Okay, how did he speak? How was his Southern drawl perceived? You know, was he, you know, um, you know, was he well-educated? Was he not? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all about character first. Notes, notes, notes. Uh, then I, uh, I, go, I go for the, the world that they live in. Start making mm-hmm. notes of of what what was it like in Memphis in those days? What was it like in Tupelo, Mississippi? You know, where was he living? Um, uh, what were the surrounds and the environment that he was living in? Same with Memphis. You know, is there? You know, how close to the Mississippi River are they? You know, mm-hmm. I've been to Memphis and I had some idea to what it was. You know, um, in those days, you know, there were trams. You know, okay, boom, boom, boom. So you start looking for all the the environmental um, uh, ideas, and then the big one is theme. I then start looking at the themes of of each sequence, and of course, the entirety of the narrative itself. What is the theme? And I start to now find ideas to thematically work with. So th- the thing is with with sound, I've always tried to. Uh, never sit on one idea for too long because you want to keep the palate always <laughs> cleansed. And I think that audiences will accept, um, you know, setting a, setting a scene, whether it be rain, storm, whatever it might be, and then you can subtly shift it. And hmm. you're not aware of the, of the way things are changing, where you're handing the baton over to the next idea. And what that does is kind of keeps the sonic architecture moving throughout um, and, and a shifting and a shifting feel. You know, I, I, I try to, you know, keep, keep the ideas moving, maybe subtly, you know, but emotionally, 
is the main. Mm -hmm. So you, you're looking at uh, uh, that, that, that visceral thing that you're looking for, mm -hmm. in character and, and story where you, 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 you're sort of using sound like music in many yeah. ways where you're looking for not just the straight up, um, the straight up, you know, hear a dog, see a dog, hear a dog. Yeah. You're, you're looking for an emotional shift. I kind of liken it to surfing, you know, where you paddled out there and it's a bit of a thing and then you get on a wave and the idea is to stay on the wave, not to get wiped out. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as you do get wiped out, you know, something's wrong. You know, yeah. There's a, there's a bump, you know. And um, so that's, so it's a lot of paperwork. And then of course we go down the road of, what do we have available to us? What do we need to record? What, what, you know, and of course, Baz is very much into the research and for the authenticity, like I mentioned. So, um, you know, at that point when the shoot was toward the end, uh, at the end of the shoot before everything got packed away, they were shooting up in Queensland, up in, in Australia here up north, mm -hmm. um, Sydney. And, um, it was difficult because of border lockdowns through the pandemic and things. But anyway, I managed to get up there with um, a recording kit and basically recorded everything that I laid my eyes on in the props. Yeah. Um, went through all the props, went from the record players to the tape machines, to the lights, the cameras, everything. It was so mm -hmm. this film. Uh, recorded everything. Uh, all the sets were still up. So I went through all the sets, which was amazing. I had full access on my own. It was amazing to do that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, I had the vehicles, um, the, the vehicles manager with me as well. And we went out onto a, a quiet location and took all the cars, took all the vehicles, the Eldorado, the Misha Smith, uh, all those cars and completely covered them all. So, yeah, it was a big uh, it was a big sort of gathering exercise at that point. I was having fun with all the cars getting to <laughs> drive them around. Crazy. It was crazy. Like you're sitting, I was sitting in that El Dorado, uh, that purple, the purple um, thing. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, and you go, okay, we've got to do a, a slow, a medium, a fast, a real fast. Yeah. Recording. And, you, you, you know, these, well, we had stuntmen driving. I yeah. Wasn't yeah. Driving. But um, the stuntmen were like, you know, dealing with these vehicles. They're like two ton. You know, yeah. and, you're, and you're pulling up so fast and you're, you're turn, <laughs> squealing. <and you're> going, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, crazy stuff. But, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun doing it, but it was really, really great to have that opportunity. The last thing you want is those cars to be sent back. I know Warner Brothers bought, you know, a handful of them, which I mm -hmm. assume will sort of go into some sort of, you know, archive sort of museum. Um, but a lot of the vehicles were privately owned. Okay. That were shipped out from the United States to Australia for the shoot, um, and, uh, and 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 local uh, local sort of car owners here as well. And of course, those cars were about to be scattered back across the globe, so I had to get them. You know. Yeah. So I pleaded with the producers to let me do it, and um, they did, which I was very grateful for. <laughs> no. What would you say was the toughest scene for you to, to tackle in the movie? Oh, boy. Yeah, there were some biggies. Probably, um, I, I would say one of the most delicate was the hayride. Mm -hmm. So that was tough because the music weave with the effects and the transitions was huge because you, 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 you started the process of, of the family singing in the alley at the back of the hayride where they were singing gospel. Yeah, and then you had the 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 colonel laying his eyes on Elvis for the first time, and then of course you're going into the the comic book situation, and then the comic book going into Tupelo, and then you know and 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 the the, the shake rag you know sequence, and then into the Pentecostal church, and then into back to the hayride, and this whole weave all the way to Elvis's first appearance on stage. That was massive. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, then subsequently, the next bit was, which was the screen queens, and the first, yeah. the first appearance. So that was that was um, full on. Uh, the next biggie, I would say, would probably be Russwood, where uh, you know, narratively, it was about you know Elvis's defiance, you know, and the fact that you know seg the whole segregation, the whole politics of the time, down in the south, and and the threat of if Elvis didn't play ball, he was going to be thrown in jail and you know, all that stuff and stop you wiggling and things. And, 
Yeah. And of course, that that concept with the with the segregation lines broken down, where you had black and white now merged as one, mm -hmm. as one youth of America, and they're speaking to the rest of you know not only the country, the world that yeah. you know, music is for everybody. So that was massive, but you had to also have the threat because it had to come from also the colonel's point of view. Yeah, that that things had to change, which of course then led him to shipping him out to uh, Germany. You know. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, so those sequences were huge, obviously, uh, uh, um, um, thematically and also just purely on a narrative point of view where you had Elvis's spirit be built to a point and then the slow, I suppose, unmaking of Elvis as it went. So the, the film changed its pace, but, mm -hmm. kind of, but kind of took on the same, you know, uh, I suppose the same feel and, and narrative sort of, um, uh, you know, emotional journey that the film took as, as also to, as Elvis was traveling through. Obviously you had the, you know, the whole Vegas thing, which was great fun to do because um, the whole Vegas thing, that was 10 year gap yeah. you know, in Elvis's timeline because he did the, the, the decade of sort of the films and then uh, with the idea of the International Hotel in Vegas opening and, and, and the deal that the Colonel had made, that was the first time uh, that Priscilla had seen Elvis perform live, you know, yeah. in all, all that period. And, and he was back, you know, with a bigger sound, a bigger, uh, a, a full piece orchestra on stage with all the backing vocalists and everything. And when he walked on stage, that was where Baz said, I want you to come up with the sound of keening. Mm -hmm. And I just was going, what, what, do you, what do you mean? And, you know, um, so what I did was we went and listened to the RCA masters of those Vegas years, and we could hear it within the crowd bleed on the microphones. Mm -hmm. But hear this wall of like white noise, you know. And Baz had said to me, that he's been on stage for whatever reasons um, in, in his career where he's witnessed it twice, where this walking on stage and having this, this sort of like wall of noise coming at you, you know, where the lights are in your eyes and all that stuff. <laughs> it's just this, this overwhelming feeling of, um, you know, of, of, of humanity, you know, coming at you with this hunger. So we went down the road of uh, listening to the masters and trying to replicate that, that feel of that energy, you know, because it, and it was building, building, building. One of the things with the crowds that Baz was very adamant about, it was, and, and it was a little, it was very tricky, was he didn't want crowd fatigue to happen to the audience. And it's very easy to get there. Very yeah. So that I think that was a, a very big challenge as well to to have the crowds be part of the music and in harmony with the story, and build where you needed them, and then calm, and then build. And so that sort of like symphony of the crowds throughout and that architecture was a huge challenge actually, uh, as to not to not to blow the audiences away because it was yeah. very easy to go too far too quick. You know. Interesting. Now I have one last question for you. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film to watch? Guilty pleasure, you know, I I would have to say, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm going to have to say uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, that's a great one. <laughs> I love that show. Yeah, I love a musical. Anyway, but I just love Tim Curry in that. And yeah, I can't get I can't get enough of that. You know, recently uh, my son and I. Uh, we're just at home together. We decided to go for the rewatch of Moulin Rouge. Oh yeah. Now, now, you know what? That film is something else. That is, I think it's like one of the greatest films of this century so far. Yeah. You know, it's one of the greatest love stories. Certainly. Yeah. I, and so there's another guilty pleasure. If I can add that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Essentially. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview this week. Oh, that's an absolute pleasure, Gordon. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. I hope that was all um, useful to you. And okay. Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, and that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com. Of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. 
And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.